kick off a two-week series. It's a short little series, so man, if you miss it this week, make sure you're here next week looking at you online. Actually, we're not looking at you online. You're looking at us. But we're glad that you're here as we start this new series called The Pursuit. The Pursuit, digging into the idea that there is a God who pursues us. There's a God who pursues us. And then if you've been around Christian circles for any amount of time, if you've been, spent any amount of time in a church, that kind of just maybe just feels normal. Like, oh yeah, God pursues us. God pursues me. God seeks me out. But I think we need to be really quick to, to say that that is not the norm. That is not the norm. That is not even a, a religious norm. Across the spectrum of the, the worldwide religions, most religions are you pursue the God. You do everything you can to earn God's attention. You do whatever you can so that way God looks your way and God responds to you. So the idea that we're, taking, that we're embarking on for the next two weeks, this, this idea that God pursues people, is totally contrary to the religious norms. And I, I want to push you just a little bit. Again, if that, if that feels normal for me to say God pursues you, I want you to, to, to realize that that is an abnormal thing. And I want to applaud you for that, that that's a normal thing. But I also want to push you to recognize that that is very unusual. That is very abnormal. That, that most worldviews outside of Omaha, Nebraska, that most worldviews outside of this church group don't view that as a normal thing. They view God as somebody that they have to please, that they have to earn their, their, their attention. They have to somehow get it so that God will notice them. So the next two weeks, we're going to dive into this passage in Luke chapter 15. These three parables that Jesus tells about the, the heart of the Father, the heart of God himself, and, and, and who Jesus is. Jesus kind of begins this as a defense for why he's spending time with those that the religious elite, the people who are comfortable with their religious authority, their religious spot in life. The people who were comfortable with, they, they weren't so happy that Jesus was spending time with the riffraff, the religious junk, the people who didn't have it figured out already. So if you've got a Bible with you this morning, I want to encourage you to open to Luke chapter 15. If you're online with us this morning, I want to encourage you to find a Bible or open another tab and to type in Luke 15. We're going to be in the first 10 verses, these first two parables that Jesus tells here in Luke chapter 15. Luke is in the New Testament. Um, if you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning, there's maybe one in the seat that you're sitting on or around you or behind you. Um, if you need to get up, full permission to get up and, and like circle around and find, find a Bible this morning and open with us to Luke chapter 15. In this passage, Jesus is going to tell three parables. and We're going to look at the first two this morning. And they're probably, again, if you're somewhat familiar with church, if you're somewhat familiar with Christianity, these are not new parables. You probably have heard sermons on these before. But the, the beauty is that we can keep coming back to these because we need this reminder. We need this reminder that the worldview that we've adapted that God pursues us is not a normal way. That the default is that you have to earn God's affection and, and Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Let me show you the heart of God, the creator, of God, the one who saw you, who designed you, who called you into being, and who set this into motion. So if you open with me to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to hear him, him being Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So we need to do a little bit of uh, digging into this because we look at this and say, So he went to H&R Block and he had lunch. Like, what, what's the issue? Like, didn't they just go to the Chinese place next to H&R Block? It just, what's, what's the problem? The tax collectors in the center, if you were here with a couple weeks ago, we, we looked at the story of a tax collector, somebody who was outside, who was an outcast, who the religious elite said, nope, there's no chance at all that God even likes them. There's no chance at all that God pays attention to them. Yeah, God created them, but at some point, they did something so terrible, they rejected Israel, they rejected God and his people, they're just not even worth it. The tax collectors and the sinners. If you think about the worst name that you can be called right now, the tax collector was the name in that time. The tax collectors and sinners, those who were outcasts, were drawing near to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees, the scribes, the religious leaders, the religious elite, the people who on paper had it all together... 
grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners. This man welcomes these outcasts. And not just welcomes them, not just like nods his head at them, but he actually eats with them. He says, you know what, you've got value and you've got worth in the way that he talks with them. You know, we need to back up and see where the context is. Anytime you're reading, especially in the New Testament, and it just jumps right in here and this happens, let's, let's back up and see who Jesus is around. Let's back up and see who Jesus is talking to and what's happening. And if you were to turn back a few pages, you would see that in Luke 14, Jesus is teaching while dining in the home of one of these religious elites, one of these Pharisees. Jesus has been invited into the home of somebody who, on paper, has it all good, has it all right, has a, a perfect connection with God, is since the very early ages that knows what the law says, has, has done everything right. I got a lot of air quotes going on this morning. Hopefully you're seeing all that. In 14, we see that Jesus is teaching well in the home of this Pharisee, and he makes, Jesus makes a big stink about how they jockeyed for position. When Jesus walked in, everybody else was like, okay, there's 10 seats, there's a host. How do I get to seat number two? How do I get to be right next to the host? And as they came in, the host kind of resituated people. And Jesus makes a big deal about how they had thought that they had all the authority. Everybody that walked in was like, I'm the big show, I'm the big guy. Put me in seat number two. Put everybody else down on like seven, eight, nine, ten. I need to be where the action is. And Jesus talks about how they had wrestled with this and he exposes them about how much pressure and how much authority and how much importance they had placed on their authority and their prestige. They're all trying to make a case for why they should be served first or seated closer. They pulled the waiter aside and said, that's my table, that's my spot. Get them out of here. I was here first. Do you know who I am? And Jesus' teaching, Jesus' teaching is totally offensive to the Pharisees and those who were supposed to be leading the people of God. So there's those who were supposed to be leading people to know who God was and to love him. But they hadn't been. They'd become lovers of power and authority and prestige, and Jesus was calling them out. But what Jesus said, while it was offensive to the religious elites and the ones who had it all figured out, was 100% perfect for those that the Pharisees had done a good job of pushing away, of keeping away from them, the riffraff who took too much time and energy to engage with, those who didn't get it as naturally as them, who didn't have everything handed to them. While the Pharisees were busy pursuing fame, fortune, and their own happiness, pursuing what their natural opportunities had given them, raised in their Jewish ways. And that was fantastic. But what they did with that Response. What they did with that was irresponsible. What they did was squander it. They'd been given so much, and they chose to, instead of embrace it, to care for others. They said, hey, I must be super special and deserve all this natural power, all this natural authority and prestige that makes pursuing my way easier. And the main goal for them was to protect that, to do what they wanted. I've got to look out for number one. But in doing that, they had returned their backs on the responsibility to extend favor, priority, and purpose to the men and women around them. See, something incredible happens when we're given privilege. All throughout Scripture, anytime there's privilege given, it's never done to store it up. It's never done to like, hey, why don't you just like kind of put that in your back pocket and keep it? Anytime that blessing is given, anytime that favor is given, it's always done for the benefit of others. From the, very beginning, from the very beginning, from Adam and Eve, from Abraham, when, when God enters into a covenant relationship with Abraham, he says, you will be a blessing, not so that you can store it up and be like, hey, you're a big time dude. He says, no, you will be a blessing to others. You will be blessed so that you can be a blessing. See, anytime we receive favor, anytime we receive blessing, for the Pharisees who received favor, who received authority, who received prestige, it was given to them in order to care for others. But they had conceptualized in their mind that their blessing was to further their own kingdom, their own power, their own authority. And that is what they pursued. The people that the religious leaders were called to bless, the riffraff, the people who heard the words of Jesus. And it drew them closer and pulled them in to hang on his truth. The leaders saw this and grew upset. Why? Because it ruined their kingdom. Because it ruined the, the, the structure that they had created. We're only two verses into this, and we have something that we have to wrestle with. Because I'm guessing that if I ask for a raise of hands, 
Who likes seeing themselves as a Pharisee? Probably nobody's hand goes up. Who likes just looking good on paper? Probably nobody's hand goes up. But there's something we have to wrestle with in these first two verses, that the Pharisees, who were given all this blessing, all this privilege, said, you know, I'm just going to flush it down the toilet. I'm not going to use it to care for other people. I'm just going to hoard it to myself. I'm going to squander it. I don't really want to care for the people around me. The Pharisees saw that it invaded their own kingdom. And see, for us, for the kingdom of God to expand, our kingdom must fall. If this passage recorded as verse 3, the Pharisees were cut to the heart and they changed their actions and they, and they stepped into God's ways, we'd be done. We'd be walking out right now. We'd be like, there's my application. But the Pharisees didn't. And so Jesus has to tell these next three parables about revealing who God's heart is because the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people who should have had it figured out, who had sat through sermon after sermon after sermon, Sunday after Sunday, after Sunday after Sunday, Sunday, after Sunday, after Sunday at Community Covenant Church. Oh, wait, no, wait, 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 wait. That was the Pharisees. That's not us. Are we cut to the heart yet? Because it's very easy for us to become just like the Pharisees, to build up our little kingdoms. But for the kingdom of God to expand, for the kingdom of God to invade our neighborhoods, for the kingdom of God to expand and invade our workplaces and our families, to invade the lives of our children and our grandchildren, our kingdoms must fall. We must be willing to put that privilege aside. Our authority and our reign must be laid down abdicated our kingdom however long established it has been must fall must be surrendered jesus is destroying the religious leaders kingdoms and so he dives into revealing the heart of who god is so we dive into the first, of these, the first of these three parables, and to give away the ending, each of these three parables are going to reveal the heart of God in contrast to the Pharisees who have been rejecting those on the outside. Did you catch what he said in verse 2? It said the, the Pharisees were grumbling. So Jesus hears this grumbling, and he responds to them. He told them this parable, talking to the religious elite, those who had it all figured out, those who had rejected and were holding at a distance, those who otherwise will be outcast. He says, what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. He opens with this parable, addressing the Pharisees grumbling. And Jesus says, you know what? It's, it's really too hard for you to fully understand the heart of God and how he is willing to put himself out for those that you would outcast, those that you would hold at a distance. Even though you should have this figured out, he says, let me reveal the heart of God to you, and let me put it in a way that you can understand. Let me connect it with something that you can understand. He says, suppose a shepherd has 100 sheep and one goes missing. Again, this is, this is a nomadic time. This isn't fenced in little nice little sheep plots where your 100 sheep stay in there. No, they're traveling around. They're looking for this little patch of grass where their 100 sheep can eat. And in the process of trying to find a place for these 100 sheep, one of them wanders off and does its own little thing. And at the end of the night, he comes out and says, counts his sheep. Not to go to sleep, but to reconcile how many he has. And he gets to 99 and says, let me check that again, and, and counts again, and still comes up one short. And so Jesus says, you know, it's commonplace for you to leave the 99 in the open country where you know they're going to be safe. You, know, you leave them with somebody else, whatever the case may be, but you're going to pursue that one other sheep. Why? Because it has value. Because that sheep means something. And so that shepherd will set out on a course for finding that one lost sheep. Yeah, he could sit back and say, eh, 99 is not too bad. I mean, that's like pretty high A's. But no, that one has value. And so the hope of finding what is lost drives the shepherd's pursuit. This hope of finding the one that is lost, this one lost sheep, drives the shepherd to leave the 99 and head out back where he's been, back into the wilderness to find this one sheep. 
that has somehow pursued something else, that has not pursued going along with the shepherd, the one who knows the way, the one that will keep them safe, but has said, you know what, I can kind of do the sheep thing on my own. I'm not sure what the shepherd really is doing. I'm going to go find that piece of grass over here. I'm going to go walk over there. The hope of finding what is lost drives the shepherd to leave the other 99. And this is what drove Jesus. Jesus was driven by the pursuit of finding those who were lost. Those who would hear and respond to the incredible news that they were not there by happenstance. That there was more to life than the day in, day out busyness of punching the time clock. That there is a God who created them, loves them, and sees them in their pain, their heartache, their shame, their desperation, their emptiness, their brokenness, their fear, their anxiety, their depression, their sorrow, and who sets out to pursue them. We can romanticize this idea as much as we want to, right? You can think that this, the sheep is probably like at the sheep spa, just like chilling, like all sheep do, getting a nice little buzz cut. But the reality is that the sheep probably has fear, that, that if, if it weren't for the shepherd going out and pursuing this sheep, we know what would happen to the sheep it would become something else's lunch. If it was not for the shepherd saying, I'm going to step out in, in hopes of finding this, the sheep really only has one ending. If it were not for the pursuit of the shepherd, the sheep would, in, would remain lost and would be stuck in that sorrow, that pain, that desperation. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to connect this to what you know, shepherding, but I'm going to use it to reveal the heart of the God, the Father the one who pursues you, the one who sees you in your pain, sees you in your darkness, sees you in your hurt, doesn't leave you out there, doesn't hold you as an outcast, but instead draws near to find you. And the hope of finding that which is lost drives God himself. I love this. When, when you look at this passage and the, the words that are used here, it says, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder, verse 6, and when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Again, this is not like shepherding 101. Jesus is using shepherding and, and sheep and sheep herding and, and all of that to connect it to reveal the truth of who God is. So this is not shepherding 101 to say this is how you have to. You probably didn't name all the sheep but he's using it to connect us to the heart of God. He calls up his friends and he says, my sheep that was lost. My sheep that was lost. See, God regards us as his. If this is, if this is a picture into the heart of God, this is not just a sheep. This is not just the sheep. This is not just a random sheep that has a, a, a serial code number or an addition date. This is not just a end and start and end date. He says, this is my sheep that was lost. When God gathers that lost sheep, when he, when he sets out to pursue those who are far from him, the shepherd regards the lost sheep as his. It shows us this beautiful picture of, of who God is. And I don't know if you know this, but you have an unshakable identity. If this is your first time with us this morning, maybe you introduced yourself, maybe, maybe you met somebody new, you've been coming here for years, and you met somebody new this morning, chances are that introduction went a little bit like this. Like this. You said, hi, my name is, and then you inserted your name. As the conversation went on, you may have introduced your spouse, you may have introduced your grandchildren, or your nieces, or your nephews, or anybody that's here with you this morning. You may have talked about what you do for a job, for a living. You may have talked about what you like to do that doesn't pay the bills and sometimes takes extra expenses. There's, there's things that may have come up in conversation that you have created an identity around. But you have an unshakable identity. All those things are aspects of your identity, but there is a deeper, more incredible identity at your core that if we choose to let it impact us, will forever change the trajectory of our lives, of our time, of our interactions with others. It's the fact that the shepherd calls us his. It's the fact that God does not just count us as one in a great big pile. But he says, I noticed that this one was missing, and it's mine. God regards us as his. This is not in an ownership kind of way, but a loving, covenantal kind of way. This is where we have to remember that this is a story to prove a point. 
This isn't 100% theological Jesus talking about shepherding, but as dumb as we are, and even though we continually act as ridiculous as sheep, God doesn't think that we're sheep. He doesn't hold ownership over us, but he claims us as his. He calls us as his, and he is delighted to regard us as his. Now, chances are, again, this is probably not a new passage. If you sat in, t- if you've sat in a church any amount of time, this is probably a common passage that's been preached on. But as I was preparing this for this, this week, one of the things I realized that I have never noticed in this before is that the shepherd carries the sheep on his shoulders. If you look back again at these verses, Verse 5, when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. You know, my children don't usually do a good job of obeying me. And sometimes I need to physically relocate them to a different room. I need to relocate them to a different environment. But that's not the picture we see here. This isn't the shepherd putting the sheep sheep under his arm and saying, I'm going to walk you back and show you how you went this wrong. He's not picking up the sheep and being like, oh, you silly sheep, what are you doing? No, Jesus says he lays it on his shoulders. Why? Because the sheep has been pursuing something else. The sheep is tired. The sheep is worn out. The sheep has been doing everything that it can to find its way back or to find its way to where it thinks it should go. And so if, if, if the shepherd were to say, come on, sheep, I'm going to put this leash around you and pull you and drag you. But that's not the picture. The picture is that the shepherd picks up the sheep and places it on his shoulders as a way of empowering and caring for the sheep. Even though the sheep is the one that left, right? It's the sheep that said, I'm going to pursue something apart from what the shepherd wants me to do. Again, this is revealing the heart of God. The heart of God who who steps into this, who carries on the burden that we deserve for our own sheep-like activity. For the fact that we have turned and rejected following God himself. God picks us up and carries the burden. Carries us, places us, doesn't put us in a stranglehold, but instead lifts us and carries us with him rejoicing, rejoicing at the extra burden of that, rejoicing that he got to step into that. Remember, it's hope that drives the shepherd to pursue us. It's hope that drives God to pursue us, to draw near to us. And it's carrying the burden that the shepherd reveals God's heart. He doesn't tell the sheep, you've got to walk it back. He picks up the sheep and meets the sheep to meet its burden, to to, to help it. It's, on, it's too weak to walk on its own. It's been so intent on pursuing its own path, its own way, trying to get back on its own. But in doing so, it's worn itself out. And it's at the end of its struggle. God regards us as his. And God picks us up and carries us in that pursuit of us. This is exactly what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is revealing, this is why I gather with the sinners, the tax collectors, the people that you don't want to associate with. Because I'm living out the Father's heart. The Father's heart who calls each person his, who carries the burden, who doesn't say, you've got to figure this out on your own, but no, instead meets us in our junk, in our mess, in our sorrow. The final thing that I love here about this is that the recovery of finding what was lost leads to a shared joy. It's not just the shepherd who's like, I'm going to have a little party. You know, maybe crack open a beer and celebrate. No, he's like, gathers the neighborhood and says, this is worth a party. This is huge. Again, this is the picture of God. This is the picture of God who says, you know, 99 got it right and that one didn't. I'm going to have a pitiful day. I'm going I'm to kick myself and reexamine my, my way of doing this. How come 100 of them didn't follow me? No. This is a picture of God who says, One that was lost, one that was stuck in desperation, one that was stuck in pain, one that tried its own way. I have found it. I have pursued it. I have taken it back. And he says, this is a cause for joy, a joy that is a shared joy. The recovery of finding that which was lost leads to shared joy. 
And this is the same joy that we see here in verses 8 through 10 in the second parable. It says, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and her neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, this is a big deal, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So we've moved from sheep, now we're, mo- we're talking about coins. Again, connecting this to something that they would understand, right? If you're here this morning, this morning and you are married, chances are there was a proposal in your story. Chances are there was an engagement ring. To connect this to 2022 for you a little bit, oftentimes a woman as that entrage of, of marriage would receive 10 silver coins. So this isn't just that she had 10 silver coins and she lost a day's worth of wages. This isn't just that she had 10 silver coins and she lost one. Come on, lady, you still got 90%. It's like the stock market today. You just lost, you just t- took, a, it took a big loss. What's the big problem? No, she sweeps out the entire house because these 10 coins are her, the source of her identity. She has lost part of this identity. And she says, I'm going to stop at nothing to find them. These matter to me. These are significant to me. This is a common occurrence in our house. We spent most of a week looking for a silly stuffed monkey that one child in our house had hidden from her brother so that way he couldn't take it from her. In the process, losing the thing. This is a common occurrence of of finding that which was lost, things that matter to us. If you often see a random coffee cup around the church, chances are it's mine because there's a trail of Marty that just gets left in in the sense of coffee mugs. A few years ago, JL lost the diamond out of her engagement ring. And she had been all over our small town in Kansas that day for whatever reason. That was the day the diamond was going to pop out. And she set forth looking for that. Now, you know us. You know our story. We aren't huge spenders. This isn't like a major diamond. But the the importance was what it signified, right? And so she went all over town trying to retrace her steps. Finally, we found it in the carpet in our bedroom about three days later just glimmering but but so this this story shows up with these 10 silver coins this this source of identity this isn't just one random coin come on lady get your act together for her this is everything this is the source of significance and we see here for her that when she finds it it's a cause to celebrate that she will stop at nothing to pursue that which was lost again revealing the heart of god I will stop at nothing to bring this significant thing to completion, all that should be there. And it leads to a shared joy. Look again with me at this passage. Oh, there's our pretty, that's not our engagement ring, that's way bigger. Look again with me at this, at this passage here. These final verses, verse 10, just so I tell you there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. We saw this at the end of the first parable as well. The whole point in this, the whole reason that God pursues people, the whole reason that he pursues those who have turned their back on him and have rejected him, the whole reason that he steps into this, the whole reason that Jesus is making this very clear for the Pharisees and the religious leaders, the people who should have had it all figured out, the whole reason is about repentance. See, the, God, the goal of God's pursuit of us is repentance. The goal is not allegiance. The goal is not appreciation. The goal is not knowledge. The goal is repentance. Friends, if you're here this morning as one who has heard, who has received it as truth and repented, you've oriented your life in accordance to God's word himself. The moment that you heard this and it made sense and you stepped into this heaven celebrated. We talk about how discipleship is, is hearing, it's making sense, but it ultimately has to impact your heart, and your will. And the moment that all kind of just started to roll together, heaven celebrated. Heaven celebrated you, one who was lost, who had been redeemed, who had been found, who had been brought back into this. And it's not just a once and done kind of thing, is it? God's grace has been poured out on you every single day of your life. You've never known a moment in your life where God's grace has not been present. Regardless of how messy your story is, God's grace has always been present in your life. You just maybe haven't been aware of it. 
It's been poured out even before you were born, but you didn't always see it. You were blinded to it, or you chose, perhaps, to reject it. God's grace has been poured out on you, drawing you to God himself as he draws near to you, drawing you to know life from death, darkness from light, hope from despair, wholeness from brokenness. It was God's grace that brought you to a place of knowing, of hearing, of receiving, and repenting, and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it's the grace of God that continues to be poured out in your life in such an incredible and unsearchable way that reveals your sin and leads you to repentance over and over and over. To see the error and folly of the way that you are pursuing and instead to pursue that which leads to life and life eternal. Because that sheep will wander off again and, and the shepherd's like, hey, no, come back, remember the last time? Remember? Turn back. That's what repentance is. Repentance is turning from one direction and going back. The goal of God's pursuit, the reason that he pursues people over and over and over and that his grace is lavished and poured out on people over and over and over is that they would turn back. Proverbs 14, and then again in 16, says there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. This is the default for us. This is what we inherited that we would step into. This is the fallen nature of our world. We pursue everything contrary to the will of God. But Romans 3.23 further confirms this, says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But all are justified by his grace, by God's grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And just a few chapters later in, in Luke 19, Jesus lays this plainly out for his disciples. He says, for the Son of Man, speaking about himself, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Why? Not that they would just have more knowledge, not that they would just live on their authority, on their own prestige, on their own privilege. But they would recognize that everything they'd been given was to care for and be engaged in the lives of others. That the grace of God that was poured out on them was not meant to be stored up and, and kept for a rainy day, but meant to be given out to the people around them, to be extended to the people around them. That there was a hope in finding which was lost by a God who regards us as his. That, that when the recovery is made, that there is a joy that God says, this is such a big deal. This is such a big deal that leads us to repentance, that calls us to turn from our sin and instead embrace God again. Friends, if you're here this morning and, and this is all new, you're like, I kind of identify with that sheep that's out in the wilderness. I, I don't see other people around me. I, I'm stuck in this sorrow and in this pain and this darkness. Friends, what Jesus is calling you to is to receive what we celebrated last week and what we continue to celebrate, that, that his death and his resurrection changes the trajectory of your life, of calls you to repentance, of calls you to receive what he has done and to experience this new life with a God who pursues you. And it's, it's as simple as saying, yes. And in that yes, you're turning and walking back, allowing the shepherd to put you on his shoulders and celebrate, rejoicing that that which was lost has been found. Friends, would you pray with me this morning?